All right, I think we're ready. Um, so welcome everybody to um, our webinar that we uh, OpenWorks is hosting and we have Russell Olson and James Waddell. I'll tell you a bit about them in a moment. They're going to talk to us about the title is trends to track as AR transforms our AI transforms our facilities. So we're hearing a lot about AI and chat GPT and um, all the computers are going to take our jobs. That's not necessarily true, as we will find out. So James and Russell are um, pretty much icons in this space, and they are smack dab in the middle of AI and what it means for facilities management. So we're excited to have them here with us. Um, a bit about OpenWorks, uh, we're the hosts of this. OpenWorks is a facilities management company. Um, we're, we're celebrating our 40th year today, uh, this year, which is really exciting. Um, we um, are really good yeah. at looking at what uh, different buildings in the same portfolio require and handling that for you. So we're kind of, uh, we say we are not a one size fits all company. We are very much the opposite. So, um, so we are a unique service provider model. Uh, we have, we are a single point of contact um, and we have multi-service visibility. We're throughout the United States as well. And you can look us up on the web, uh, www.openworksweb.com. Um, now let me introduce uh, the stars of our show, Russell and James. So Russell Ols Olson, he is the founder of ROI Consulting Group and he specializes in workplace technology and IWMS solutions. So making sure that everything is integrated uh, with the technology in your buildings. And James Waddell is the EVP and Managing Director of Cognitive. He has a really keen understanding of challenges and opportunities that are in FM when it comes to technology and also takes in the practical considerations of technology in implementation. And I think that's one of the things that's really compelling about this um, webinar is the practicality of it. And with that, uh, we'll get started. I'll hand it over to Russ, Russell and James. Um, welcome and thanks for doing this webinar with us. Thank you, happy to be here. So we'll take it through the agenda really uh, at a high level. You see, we'll, we'll be covering a lot of stuff. I don't want to go into this in great detail as we'll be covering it more as we go. So a little bit of a history and background when it comes to FM technology. I'm sure anybody who's dialed into this knows that the, the facilities management part of the organization is usually, uh, let's see, way behind the curve when it comes to technology. Uh, but with things like uh, what happened with COVID, it seems like the facilities team has been thrust into the limelight and we're seeing more and more demands from a technology standpoint to have them start to do more with less and leverage whatever technology they can uh, to be able to keep pace. Uh, as, as you can see here, the evolution of FM technology started with standalone systems uh, way back when, I think when my hair was black and I was starting to do some of this stuff. Uh, there was no such thing as the internet. There was no networks. Everything was standalone. Um, as the things evolved, the applications went from on-premise client server to now uh, SaaS uh, cloud-based solutions are what we're starting to see more and more. Um, they've eclipsed the on-prem solutions and they've started to become more and more integrated. Uh, they've been opened up. They're able to connect with other systems, talk to each other, make those types of things. Um, I guess seamless. And then the last piece is we've started to see over the last several years, sensors become a bigger and bigger part of things. Um, we, we saw an evolution of the sensors pre-COVID as our clients wanted to know how space was being utilized in order to shrink their footprint. Um, then with COVID, with nobody being in the office, nobody really cared so much. But then as they started to bring people back, we saw uh, a renewed interest in the sets of technology. And I think it's really 
uh, it, it's great because it allows you to get that granular insight into how the workplace is being utilized, uh, primarily for occupancy or utilization sensors. But we're seeing other trends where uh, more operational sensors. Uh, the facilities teams are getting smaller and smaller with fewer people uh, in the buildings. Um, there wasn't a need for as big a team, so they started to lean heavier on sensors to monitor the buildings uh, from an operations and maintenance standpoint. Um, all of this stuff is great because the technology now is starting to catch up on the facilities front, but with that uh, comes lots and lots of data. And that's why we're here today, because I think this sort of uh, dovetails into the whole AI discussion, because now that you're accumulating all this data, it becomes, what do we do with it? You know, to, to add to that a little bit, Russell, I was thinking about this last night. You know, we had uh, a lot of standalone systems in facility management for such a long time. We, we tend to call those point systems or systems that were deployed for a very specific reason, generating very specific data sets. There was a trend just before COVID where we were thinking about how to take those, those data sets out of their silos to generate better insights. And to a certain extent, I guess you could call that integrated systems from our viewpoint. Really, it's more of an integration of data to figure out how we can get more uh, insights from the data sets that we already had. Uh, and, and completely agree with you on the sensor front. I think everything is getting yep. a sensor now, and it should, right? Absolutely. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about AI and, and demystify that a little bit. Um, AI has a very broad meaning now. We're going to take a look at some examples in just a second, but, but is it really intelligence? And, and the short answer is it's easier to think of it as intelligence. Uh, it's a machine that's able to reason. It's a machine that's able to display empathy. Uh, it's a machine that's capable of creativity. And this has all been proven out over time when we think about a particular version of AI. Uh, and that's what's being adopted for the most part when you think chat GPT or Microsoft Azure AI or BARD. When we say AI, that's kind of what we talk about in terms of AI. It's this thinking machine that is able to produce work results. But that's not always what AI means. So by way of example, uh, if you go to Amazon and you see Amazon is suggesting certain products for you, that's a version of AI. It's been around for quite some time. Netflix, very similarly, or really any interface that you may have where they're recommending something for you to purchase or watch, that's a version of AI uh, that's been out there for quite some time. So let's let's peel that onion a little bit, as they say, and go a little deeper. There's really uh, four different versions of AI that you can uh, think about uh, to context in the world of facility management to help keep you straight when people are having conversations about AI. Most of what we do in facility management really is machine learning, and it, the industry calls it artificial intelligence. But machine learning, uh, by way of example, uh, if you put a sensor on a motor uh, or a generator, you can determine its speed, its heat, its load, its vibrations. Over time, you can get a lot of data as to how it operates under various conditions, and you can monitor to that data for spikes or irregularities. And based on those irregularities, you can then go, hmm, this thing is, is starting to fail. And this particular irregularity means the front bearing's failing or whatever, right? You can get you can get very predictive by looking at the spikes in the data set over time to say, yes, when I see this data pattern, it means this particular thing is failing in this machine that's being measured, and we need to perform maintenance on it. That is a version of AI, uh, at least that's the industry term now, but it's really based in machine learning. Generative AI, relatively new branch of AI, it's able to create original content. That's where the emotive responses for AI comes from, uh, empathy, uh, uh, creativity, and they're based on language models. Um, and not to get too metaphysical, but if it feels like it has empathy, if it's presenting itself as having empathy, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's empathetic to your needs, but many patients who use uh, generative AI for, uh, uh, pay, uh, for doctor patient interactions or advice uh, will rate the generative AI assistant as being more empathetic to their needs than a real person. Very exciting time that we live in when that can happen. Um, so it's based on language. It's able to generate uh, content uh, and, uh, and is empathetic. AI bots are typically based on a 
some level of machine learning and generative AI where they're able to follow a prescribed process. As long as you're pretty good in your coding, really good in your coding, in fact, and you've got this really good process defined, it can take in uh, sensor data, it can follow the process, it can then generate uh, some uh, deliverables or some insights into what's happening. Now, here's where it gets really exciting from an industry perspective. There's this thing called autonomous agents, and they're comprised of multiple AI bots. And they're able to not just follow a prescribed process, but they're able to understand what the work result is that they're looking for, what the optimization definition of optimization is. They're able to start with the process, but they're able to get creative in that process to make sure that they meet the optimization that they've been given. And that's a world that we live in right now in terms of bringing optimizations to facility management. It's in that autonomous agent world. I will preface, and we started the conversation with this way in the introduction, I think it's very important to say autonomous agents are not here to take over the world or take over the work that we do. They're here to be very good assistants to us so they can lighten the workload of the busy work that we typically have, help us focus on the things that, that uh, are more valuable and more strategic to the organization. Now that might have sounded very exciting, but we're still very early anywhere in terms of AI, particularly in autonomous agents uh, in what's happening from a facility management perspective. AI does need data, uh, and that's not a traditional strength of facility systems, and we know that. And, and by data, I mean, let, let's, let's peel that a little bit, right? So there's a lot of ways that you can deploy AI anywhere, and especially within facility management. The way that we, typically recommend that you deploy AI, is not to take a lots of data and try to make your own AI internally. It's called a large language model. That's not our recommendation. Our recommendation is to use an existing AI model and um, pass data from your sensors, and you can, you can normalize it and you can anonymize it, but you pass data from your system or from your facility management that you're managing to the intelligence uh, have it run it, have it run its process or, or produce its queries or whatever you might need to do with that AI, and then pass that information back to you or the user in order to move forward with that. Um, certainly, that's not the right approach for everyone. If you're a very large organization and you have lots of data, like some of these financial organizations, it does make sense to develop your own large language model. Uh, but there's some caveats there. You need to be careful about what you're sharing with the large language model because it could become public and you don't want your private data to become public. So early, we're very much at the early adoption phase. Facility management data can be used. There's not a lot of it, uh, but more importantly, we need sensor data uh, and we need data to help the agents understand what's happening in our workplace for it to be uh, efficient. We certainly don't have uh, lots of money these days in facility management, so we are budget constrained. However, uh, AI and agents in particular, AI agents in particular, can help us become much more efficient. So we're able to use those lower budgets or those constrained budgets in a much more efficient way. So there's an inherent ROI when we talk about deploying AI within a facility or within a corporate real estate portfolio to help us become optimized and to save money. More importantly, what we're looking for is a better uh, experience for those within the built environment. So that can be a sports stadium, could be healthcare, it could be office environment. Uh, but there is a cost associated with it. We can become more efficient, but primarily we're looking for a better experience. And I guess here we're, we're just mentioning a couple of different technologies where some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, they've been around, a few of these have been around for a while, but they're getting better and better. I know I don't have the visual aids, but uh, we have a, a sensor, what it looked like a beacon from about five years ago, which was probably about as big as my fist, versus some of them today, if anybody's seen uh, some of the sensors from someone like Disruptive, they're about the size of a Scrabble tile, but uh, about half the thickness. Um, peel and stick, and they have a 15 year battery life and probably cost a fraction of what those beacons cost five years ago. So it's it's getting cheaper, it's getting easier, it's getting smaller. Um, so things like using your phone, um, the phones are being used for just about everything here, augmented reality, um, anybody who's played Pokemon Go or seen it, 
knows exactly what that is, but just think about that now being applied to a maintenance technician walking into a boiler room and not knowing exactly which piece of equipment that they need to be working on or performing for preventative maintenance on. They can simply take out the camera using some kind of AR or VR, point the camera, move it around the room, and it'll highlight the devices that they need to be interacting with. Um, those types of things are here. They are now. Um, as James said before, though, there's a cost to them, but that cost has been coming down considerably. Um, other things like the Google Glass, or I think Apple and Meta have their versions of these VR headsets. Um, Microsoft, I think, has one as well. Uh, still rather expensive. Um, some are somewhat bulky, but the, the technology is getting smaller. It's improving vastly. We've seen use cases with things like that where um, uh, one happened to be a maintenance team outfitted with Google Glass in a museum because the maintenance technicians were going to be uh, cleaning and maintaining priceless uh, artworks. So the Google Glass enabled them to see exactly where they were, what it was that they were cleaning, and then pull up a list of all of the cleaning agents that they were supposed to be using, whatever the procedures were, to, to make sure it eliminated any of the guesswork and there, the cost justification, um, ruined one piece of priceless art and the thing more than pay for itself <laughs> so it was quick and easy but you can see here um some of these technologies are now starting to gain some traction uh we have seen on the design and construction front the ar and vr uh is becoming more and more uh everyday occurrence where in the fm it's still making its way in there but i think it's only a matter of time um, lastly, just on the the indoor wayfinding or indoor GPS, as we have at that first one on the left, um, that's another one where AI is really starting to come into play. Um, anybody who's used this before, a lot of the vendors that provided any kind of wayfinding, uh, especially in corporate environments, if somebody moved from point A to point B, they had to go back in and figure out what happened and then read draw all those possible paths. Now AI is able to figure out what happened and redraw those paths and do it automatically instead of having that human interaction, which took a lot of time and of course had an associated cost. You know, Russell, one of the things I saw um, in terms of a demonstration for design, uh, which would include FM input into design, was a very large warehouse and they projected the floor plan onto the screen, onto the floor so that you could walk through the office space on the floor plan. Interesting, mm -hmm. kind of gives you a sense. But then uh, as a demonstration, they also had augmented reality. So in the space, you could put on your headset and you could see different types of furniture and, and basically virtually interact with the space. Yes. Uh, it saves so much money on proof of concepts from a construction perspective. Uh, from design and construction, the, the coordination between trades because now, uh, although you could do it in a BIM model, this allows you to do it in the field and see if there, there were any existing field conditions, um, as well as if there were any kind of changes. Think about changing the color or finish and being able to see what that looked like from within the model. Um, it's got a huge impact. Agreed. So, um, you know, let, let, me, let me start off here and talk a little bit about uh, AI's current use case, and we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit more uh, about what VergeSense has done as an example of this. But when we think about data and facility management, there's so many dashboards that we have, and so many reports that we look at, and they're very important things that we need to be aware of. The most prevalent part of what AI can do for us right now, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about uh, large language models and, and generative AI at the moment. They allow us to have natural language queries on data sets. Uh, I think that's probably the best short term impact or application for AI that we can think of at the moment is if you have data, you don't have to call somebody to, to make sure the dashboard's right for you or that it has the right kind of data. There's still going to be dashboards for personas, but if it's not answered, you don't have to go hunting for the data. You literally just ask the data for the insights that you may need and the large language model will reason out how best to answer that question for you, find the data, generate the answer, and then provide you with the answer in the short term. That's one example, I think, of a short-term application. 
And some of the others here uh, that immediately jump to mind is like the building automation or control systems. We're, we're getting asked this uh, almost on a weekly basis from a variety of clients. Is is there some way to have the sensors interacting with the, the building control system so that you don't necessarily just set the air conditioning to come on at eight o'clock in the morning, shut off at six o'clock at night and do that Monday through Friday. Now, because of people with hybrid work schedules and uh, there being lesser uh, adherence to those old paradigms in terms of coming to work, uh, now we could have the sensors tell you when a certain number of people have gotten onto the floor and then start to adjust the temperature accordingly as they start to see more people. Um, so things like that uh, are starting to pop up more and more. Um, I mentioned the smart cleaning before, like that AR, VR integration with the cleaning crew to make sure that they're doing what they need to, or even things like the, the predictive maintenance. Um, you mentioned a few things, James, with the sensors on actual equipment. Uh, a few use cases we've seen pop up are doing things like uh, rather than send the janitorial services team in to clean the restrooms every hour just because, we could put sensors on the doors so it counts how many times the doors open and closed and then make the assumption that, oh, there's been enough activity in the restroom. Now let's send somebody out to clean. It, uh, I'm, I'm, the use cases that we can think of are, are, and that we're actually doing are just stunning to me. I, I'm, I'm always, even in thinking about them, I'm just at all about what, what is being done and what can be done. Hey, speaking of what can be done, <laughs> Great segue. <laughs> so I guess, and uh, there was a, a thing about the conference room uh, reservations on the last slide, and this kind of takes that one step further. Uh, we talked about chatbots a little bit, and that was probably one of the first illustrations I saw was some integration with a chatbot in the reservation system to say things like, I, I need a conference room and the chatbot can respond when you have those guardrails up, like, oh, a conference room, okay, when do you need it? Where do you need it? How many people are coming? And it would slowly kind of narrow it down and then present what was available. Now there are things like the automatic seat assignments where the AI will actually analyze what's happening in the space look at your patterns, like have you reserved space in the past? How often are you here? How long are you here? And then make recommendations to optimize how people are, are actually being seated inside of spaces. So things like back to the building controls and automation, we're not gonna uh, heat and cool an entire building when we've only got a sparse sprinkling of people throughout. So rather than have like one person sit on a floor because they were unlucky enough to show up and they were the only person on their team that day that was in the office, have them sit and condense everybody onto a single floor or a single area until that hits a critical mass and spill over to the next floor and the next one so that we're optimizing uh, the actual use of the space across not only the people in the space, but all the other utilities that go into it. So the heating, the cooling, the electric, lighting, et cetera. You know, thinking in terms of AI, the world is 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 fixed on large language models at the moment. Um, however, there is an, an image component to AI, and it's 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 a little bit in these bullet points here. Um, you can classify equipment based on a photo of it, or a picture of it, or a real time mm -hmm. image capture of it. And and I think that becomes incredibly important from a facility management perspective. Like you might be confused as to which breaker you might need to turn off. I hope not, but maybe. Um, and then augmented reality or image capture, uh, computer vision sometimes it's called, uh, can help you identify those things. And the other thing to, to, to keep in mind in the, in the mid to long term potential, I would say, is um, when we think about open AI and, and, and these large language model tools from a large language model perspective, it makes everyone who has access to the internet or these tools an absolute expert on whatever they're able to ask of, right? So it's like having an assistant that's the world's smartest five-year-old and, and they have a PhD in anything and they have access to just about any amount of information. So as, as the adult that needs to work on something, I need to be able to ask it correctly to have it help me get the work done that I need to get done. And where we're at right now from an enterprise perspective, uh, OpenAI just made this announcement. Microsoft's been pushing on this for a while. Google's right behind them. 
It's how do we turn these tools into enterprise grade tools so that the individual doesn't necessarily need to be the absolute expert on how to tease this information out, but that this information is presented in a very meaningful contextual um, way, the time that it needs to be presented. And right now is a perfect time from a facility management perspective. We think about local law 97 uh, in, in New York, that may not be the right term, but it's the sustainability energy reduction law that's just that's now being implemented in New York buildings to make sure that they're uh, achieving net zero uh, decarbonization and energy reduction. How do you achieve that beyond just telling people not to turn on the lights, right? So how do we automate that process? How do we understand what's happening in the space from a systems perspective? And then how do we autonomously adjust those systems to make sure that they're most efficient without adversely affecting the occupants? Well, the answer is AI uh, mm -hmm. from a facility management perspective. I uh, mentioned Verge Sense a little earlier. Uh, to my knowledge, they were one of the first. So kudos, hats off to Verge Sense, you guys. Um, Verge Sense, for those that don't know, uh, and I'm not, I don't work for Verge Sense. I'm not an expert on Verge Sense. So this is just me presenting what I think I know of Verge Sense. So if I'm wrong, forgive me, Verge Sense. Um, Verge Sense is an occupant. Um, an occupant system with sensors that will help you understand uh, where your occupants are within a space. And there's a number of metrics that fall beyond that. Essentially, sensors that tie into software platform, software platform provides you insights as to what's happening in your workplace. Knowing that they have a large amount of data, knowing that they the reports are very important, they were one of the first, if not the first, to come up with uh, a large language model interface to be able to query your data using natural language. Uh, and I think that is absolutely where the world is going. That's more or less step one, being able to have good conversations with your data to understand the insights. Uh, think about all the consultants and people, and I'm one of them, uh, <laughs> consultants and people that you don't necessarily need to contact anymore if you're able to have really good conversations with your data and generate the insights that you need. The next step beyond that is how do I take action on those insights? And then how can I use AI or an autonomous agent to help me rather quickly take action on those insights? And that's where we're spending a lot of our time and effort right now in terms of uh, using the data that we have to optimize space with human oversight. We don't want to take that away, absolutely with human oversight, but to make sure that uh, we're doing that in a very speedy way and that we're doing that in a very efficient way. Yeah, a couple of, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, there you go. Yeah, just, just wanted to make a, a, a another quick note with regards to, to Verge Sense and, and the integration here, because this is this is fantastic and a great illustration on how AI can be applied. It, in, in some cases, the sensors like a Verge Sense sensor, they take readings every, let's say, five seconds or 15 seconds, or depending on if they're battery or hardwired, but um, if you could imagine the number of sensors deployed, now Verge Sense, you have one sensor ceiling mounted, covers a fairly decent piece of uh, space as well as it could be multiple workspaces, but each one of those workspaces, it's constantly polling to see whether or not there's signs of life in that space. So the amount of data that it, a single sensor accumulates throughout the course of a day is enormous. Uh, Virgence has very nice dashboards. Most of the sensor vendors have these great uh, UI, UX, you log in, you get this portal, it kind of gives you an overview and you can drill down, et cetera. But what we find is that's great, but then to James's point, it's how do I make that actionable? Um, and that's where I think uh, a lot of people will stop. The sensor thing was great. It gave you some, some general insight, but unless you really dug into it or uh, had <laughs> some amazing psychic abilities, it was really difficult to predict um, any kind of patterns outside if I could see, oh, there's a spike on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then it falls off again in terms of occupancy. Um, this allows you to say, okay, let's look for trends, let's make recommendations on what I could be doing differently or what I could be doing better to improve it instead of leaving that to the end user to you know, limit its success at times. We're going to run through some use cases here really fast. Um, so what, what we've done uh, on, on our side is we have a number of personas. Those personas, you can think of them as uh, personalities. Those personalities are based on uh, an aggregation of experience and knowledge, uh, work roles, 
that's that's uh, being gleaned uh, through large language models and artificial intelligence. In this example, what we're going to be talking about is uh, Sarah. She's a vice president of City Solo, so she's a senior vice president of corporate real estate for a large financial corporation. So it's an aggregation. In this case, it's an aggregation of probably ten or fifteen different uh, corporate real estate personas that we have available to us. The way that we use those personas is, as an example, uh, if you have a design narrative, how will the design narrative impact or be accepted by certain personas? So it used to be that you went through a process with your design team and and, and maybe uh, you, you did a bunch of surveys or some surveys and you sort of had an understanding of maybe six or 10 personas for your, for your work. And then you would use that uh, to guide your design or office space optimization. The way that we're moving forward is we have these artificial intelligences now that take over or act as those, an aggregate of those individuals. Uh, and they're able to make uh, informed decisions and opinions and provide critiques uh, as if they were an individual that work within your company. And that's really changing the game when you think about uh, speed to market and, 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 uh, and validating your designs uh, and impact and how to measure your, your, your designs over time. So workplace optimization uh, is one way to do that, where you can use predictive analytics based on personas to get an understanding of, of, of not just how the space will be used, but the type of work that will occur in that space. And we talked a little bit about BAS systems earlier and being able to use sensors uh, in order to, say, modify uh, the conditions based on the number of people. The very next step of that from an optimization perspective is understanding how many people I have in the space for how long and the type of work that they're going to be doing and the environment that they want to be in. So if it's heads down work, you might want to create an environment that's very similar to, I don't know, like a library environment. So you might want to change uh, your audio component as well as the air handling units uh, so that you don't need a lot of air in that space because it's more like a library. If on the other hand, they're going to be doing some very energetic work, uh, maybe it's team building or, or, or team meetings in that space, maybe you want it to be more like a coffee shop, in which case you'd want to turn the air volume up pretty high because you want to you want it to be uh, very fresh in there. You want it to be uh, feel like it's very airy. Maybe you feel like you're outside. These are things that used to be way on the periphery of things that maybe we could do one day because they optimize the experience uh, of the people in the space. And we knew that eventually we'd be able to do it. These are things that absolutely not only can be done today, but are being done today. Uh, and at the higher end of the built environment spaces uh, over time and what's happening right now time is being very, very compressed what used to take a year and now takes a week in terms of what is uh, what does good look like from a built environment perspective these will definitely be coming to office spaces near you or hospitals near you or college campuses near you built environment you're going to be looking at spaces that are able to take into account not just the number of people but the type of work or activity that's being done in that space and near real-time optimization of it. Employee feedback analysis is very similar to that. You have ways to report whether, I don't know, maybe it's conference room systems work or they don't work or how they can be made better. They'll automatically be taken into account in your system or your building operating system, which is your autonomous agents running the, the building. And they'll just loop those in, into your corporate standards. Again, the, things being done today. That's not something that could be done. That is being done today. Wellness program tracking and tailoring, somewhat, uh, somewhat self-descriptive there. Uh, we're able to measure the effectiveness, automated reporting, uh, very important uh, to be able to generate contextually relevant reports to the person you're talking to at the time that it needs to be delivered. In fact, we're, work, we're, we're doing some experimentation on websites so that it's not the same website for everyone. If you log in to the website, it'll be rewritten. The page will be basically the same information, but now it's contextually relevant to you. That's the type of automated reporting that we're talking about. It'll happen in near real time. It is happening in near real time. And if it's something that doesn't quite make sense to you, you just simply ask the report what it means or how you can make it better or go move deeper into that. And it will provide that uh, deeper insight into it. That gray area, I think, is the piece we want to focus on from a facility management perspective. We mentioned a little bit about this. It's predictive analysis and analytics across every fashion. Facility management has a little bit of data, 
facility management and enterprise systems need to start sharing data in a much better way. So all of those things locked away in the Wi-Fi systems, in the Microsoft Office backend servers related to email, all the Teams data, all of that stuff is up for grabs at the moment. And it's important that we have these conversations about what it means to optimize the experience for the occupants in a space and not just look at, am I operating a good building efficiently and, and least expensively versus am I providing good employee experience versus are my employees working well in teams? All of that is basically the same conversation. So we need to remove those silos. Uh, silos. AI and the ability to start combining data generating meaningful insight and then providing automations for that is absolutely where we are as an industry right now. Russell? Yeah, I <laughs> think that was pretty thorough. I'm trying to think of if there is anything that I could possibly add to that. That was fantastic, James. Oh, good, 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 good. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up with yeah. a few questions here. Yep, there are super big couple in the Q&A section. Anybody has any questions? Um, there are a couple that did come in, uh, but you can go to the tab, the Q&A tab at the top of your navigation bar. And um, we do have, well, we wait for some more to come in. We do have a couple here. So I think you just covered this, but maybe this is an opportunity to go a little bit deeper. Uh, how can AI be utilized as a risk management tool for a facility to reduce incidentals and also have a proactive approach to maintenance? You know, the, the, so there's a few things there, and I, and, and hopefully I've understood the the correction, uh, the the question correctly. Um, when I think about incidentals, I, I sometimes think about attic stock or or things that uh, I need to make sure of logistically that I have uh, on site. There's there's some interesting ways that you can get uh, you can start developing program and project. Um, milestones using AI, which includes the amount of uh, data, the downtime in your facilities, how the facility is being used, the scheduling of the facilities. Um, so I would say using artificial intelligence in a, in a way that maybe you haven't thought of yet would be a really good way to address that question. It's gathering all the data from how the occupants use that space and taking into account the maintenance needs that you have, as well as the attic stock that you may have, to make sure that you're not going to run into any particular milestone issues in that project schedule. And, and there are some very good tools uh, that will help plan and manage a project using AI as a uh, as an assistant uh, now, in those. So hopefully now, James that. and they're asking about uh, the second part of the question is like have a proactive approach to maintenance. So I think that was something that we had talked about, but that would be more the predictive maintenance, which would work several different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did mention that, but just to put a cap on that, um, yeah. predictive maintenance, uh, it, it's been done for quite some time. In fact, many of the, uh, the jet engines that are in our planes these days, even though the fuselage is made in the 80s, which is a little scary, the jet engines are relatively new on many of those aircraft. They have a lot of sensors, and those sensors are, and I think I mentioned it, are measuring things like vibration, fuel usage, yeah. uh, uh, many, many things. And what we're looking for are anomalies over time, and and those anomalies over time are are uh, are observed using machine learning and just artificial intelligence. We could say, when they're observed, the artificial intelligence is enabled to predict which component is required from a maintenance perspective, which could mean it's outside of its normal maintenance schedule, but it is presenting itself as a potential problem that needs to be addressed now. So that 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 is very real from a facility management perspective. Which is, of course, different than just your typical plan preventative maintenance, mm -hmm. which would be you know, every X number of months, weeks, et cetera, we're going to come in and perform some kind of maintenance or inspection here. It's anticipating that based off of uh, other things that could be happening. Um, so vibration, we had somebody else doing acoustical sensors. So mm -hmm. if the machine was making a, a different noise than usual, it could be trained to detect that and immediately send an alert. Precisely. Okay. 
Hey, uh, I'll just put a note here that if we don't get to all the questions, I will capture all these and get answers for you um, and we'll send them out there when we do a recap. We're going to send a recording obviously to everybody. So if we don't get to the your question, we will um, answer it in the in another email. Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, have do you know that if there have been any use cases that allows AI to help with supply orders so you can move away from an old catalog or list approach, but um, just anything to help with ordering those supplies if you're a you know yeah. commercial cleaning company or something like that? No, I, I know from the either CMMS side or IWMS side of things that some of the solutions allow you to keep track of stock or storeroom supplies. Um, when there's a work order created, it could either recommend what supplies are necessary, and then you can adjust estimated versus actual use of those supplies, and thresholds could be set so that if in the storeroom you have, you know, X number of light bulbs and you're going to go out and change the light bulbs, it'll tell you when that threshold has been hit and alert you to reorder. I could see the AI component of this would actually monitor that and follow through on the, the entire procurement of those light bulbs. Um, but not only that, but look at it across the enterprise so that you're not just buying, let's say a dozen light bulbs for location A, when you might need light bulbs all across your portfolio, in which case it can make recommendations on bulk ordering those light bulbs, therefore driving the cost down considerably by making that kind of purchase instead of the little one-offs. It'd be hard to, to augment that answer. That's, that's spot on. Uh, maybe toss in computer vision. So if you're not quite sure because um, you maybe you have 10 different manufacturers of chairs and you don't want to you know spend half your day trying to figure out which model chair that is you can snap a picture with your phone use a computer vision application that will tell you the model and uh, and how best to acquire a new chair now it would be possible james because you mentioned like the uh the visual aspects or the photographic aspects of ai um i've seen things where it could, ai can be trained to monitor what the camera is seeing and detect, as you said, anomalies earlier, but like from, from a security standpoint, I've seen it where if the same person walks past the, the front of a, an ATM vestibule more than once, it'll trigger an alert. Or if the same car is parked in front of the bank, like those types of things, but I'm sure we could train it to say, okay, this is what the storeroom looks like. And based off of what that image of a fully stocked storeroom looks like, you can train it to see if the, the storeroom has been depleted and therefore immediately recognize and, and issue some kind of request for to purchase more widgets. It's certainly in the realm of possible. I, I was reading one, uh, one research paper where they're now able to uh, early detect hundreds of, of common health issues uh, with a single retinal scan. Uh, so before you're aware that you have a particular health issue, the single retinal scan will will let you know, nor is there any tests currently that, that can predict this early uh, beyond that retinal scan. So it, it's, yes, it, if you can think of it, it's probably doable. <laughs> so we just need to, we need a really good business case for it, but it could be done that way for sure. Um, I think we should end on this really, um... Interesting question. Uh, do you believe that AI is a utilization to improve the experience for visitors or facility managers? Uh, so that's the first part. And then the second part is how do we make sure that all the stakeholders are in consideration when designing a system? Let, let me let me hop in first, Russell, if you don't mind. Go on, sure, um, sure. Uh, I think that our industry first needs to consider automations. So how do I how do I make it easier by automating uh, repetitive tasks for everyone involved? So from a visitor management perspective, there's some very good uh, automation tools that allows the visitor to check in, get their badge, move through the facility uh, in a very uh, meaningful way. W once we've once we've gotten that figured out, let's say, or optimized from an automation perspective, then we can start looking at how artificial intelligence can take that one step further uh, at reducing the workload from people. So the answer is absolutely yes. I, I wouldn't necessarily start the conversation with AI first. I'd start the conversation with automations 
first? How do I automate the function? And then how do I bring in AI to make it better? Yeah, the, the, the thing that popped into my head, though, is from the visitor experience, it would really depend on what particular vertical we were talking about. Uh, you're looking at the typical corporate environment. Eh, you know what? They come into the reception or they come through the lobby into reception. And th there's not a ton of visitor experience, really, that that would be augmented by this. But I think if you were looking at like hospitality or retail, like uh, amusement parks, um, those types of things, I'm sure they've got full teams that are just focused on user experience where the AI will really start to come into play when they start to analyze like the, the paths people take, how long, like um, we're doing a project with the museum and one of the things that they're using sensors for is dwell times. They wanna see how long people stay at particular exhibits and where exactly they're staying. Cause now they could start to make it the, the whole path through the exhibit space that much more optimized as well as if there are, are certain things either in retail or in the museum uh, example, if there are certain things that people even aren't stopping at, then it's either why could it just be we put it in a bad place and we need to move that to the front um, or uh, retail they call it the end caps like that's the primo space at the end of the aisle where they stick stuff or might be in the back of the aisle where things go to die. So there are certain things that um, you'd have to look into, but I think it really, it's going to vary by the industry or type of space that you're talking about. Well said. Awesome. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, we actually went over just a little bit. I hope nobody minded, uh, but we are we are going to send this out a recording tomorrow and we'll get your other questions answered as well. Thank you so much everybody for joining us. We really appreciate your attendance and uh, thank you, James and Russell. Have well, a great day. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yep. Bye bye.